Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. giant to be here. <laughs> Dang, look at those arms. <laughs> one, one day I'll get there. But uh, so I, got, I want to introduce our speaker today real fast. He is the lead pastor of uh, Vineyard Church in Hagerstown, Maryland. Come on, Maryland. Let's get some noise. Him and his wife, Jess, have been, have been doing a fantastic job, and God has been doing amazing things up there. You'll hear a little bit more about that in the message. But uh, I, I just want to share a story. I got to share. Do. I did it last night. Okay, about 13 years ago or something like that, Pastor Chris came down and spoke at a youth event that we had here in Virginia Beach. And I was new to the faith, didn't really know a lot about Jesus and things like this. I just remember hearing him speak and saying, wow, this guy is really intense. He is awesome, you know? And then the, the biggest takeaway I got from the message that, stu that stuck with me the whole time, 13 years later, in the message, he said, don't eat Pop-Tarts because they're bad for you. <laughs> I don't eat them. That's good. So thank you. Thank you for that. All That's right. right. So, so, all right. Hey, let's lean in, open our hearts, open our minds. I believe God has a word today that can transform your life forever. All right. So everyone give it up for Pastor Chris Slaughterback. Hey, Amen. Good morning. Well, I know it was successful 13 years ago because it's always my goal every time I share that someone takes away one thing. So... <laughs> Whether it's Jesus or Pop-Tarts, they took away one thing, and uh, so it was a successful evening. So it's just exciting to be here at Virginia Beach. I love the beach, and when I get invited to come and share, I, I will be here. Uh, there's nothing like waking up in the morning, seeing the waves, and just enjoying uh, the ocean. So I just want to thank Andy and Sharon and Samuel, of course, for having me this weekend and giving me the opportunity to share and to kick off this new series, Running with the Giants. Now, I do want to encourage you that typically when a pastor gets invited to uh, guest speak at another church, we always ask the topic and then hope that we have the freedom to pull one of our old messages that we shared like a year or two ago to bring with us so that way we didn't have to really prepare for the weekend. But Andy happened to call me and say, hey, Chris, we want you to kick off this series. And I was like, sure, I'd love to. That, that weekend works for me. Uh, what's the topic? And he was sharing about running with the Giants. I was like, great. I have a, a great uh, hero of the faith that I can share about. He goes, oh, but I want you to speak on Noah. And I was like, well, well Andy, I, I've never shared on Noah. I don't have any, any sermon that I can bring with me. That means that I'm actually going to have to prepare for the weekend. He goes, well, that's the weekend you have. There's a, a series bumper video, so you have to share on Noah. So I want to encourage you that uh, this entire week I've been preparing this talk, and God has really uh, been working on my heart uh, through Noah. And what he's been working on my heart with, I'm sure he's going to do in uh, yours as well. Now, many of you are thinking, well, Chris, football's over. Why are you wearing a Ravens jersey? And yes, that is correct. Many of us sat through what many consider the worst Super Bowl in the history of the NFL. Sports Illustrated's post-game headline read, Super Bore, and the, and the contest at Atlanta's Mercedes-Benz Stadium had the lowest television ratings in a decade. Okay, Rolling Stone magazine wrote this, on behalf of Patriots fans everywhere, I apologize for the Super Bowl. We know it was a terrible game. My personal excitement level Sunday night was between enjoying a good cheeseburger and waking up to find a boil on my face had gone away. 
Sunday's game was 14 punts and four hours of offensive ineptitude capped by an ending that depressed everyone outside of New England. So yes, the NFL is over. The Super Bowl was a letdown, but there were a few, for, were a few bright spots. For example, the uh, Super Bowl MVP, Julian Edelman, He's a wide receiver and punt returner for the New England Patriots. Believe it or not, though, he actually played quarterback at Kent State University in college and was originally drafted in the seventh round. And see, most of the time, seventh round draft picks don't even make NFL rosters. Here's this guy becoming the Super Bowl MVP. The, uh, saying this about Julian Edelman, no, we don't want you. Julian Edelman first heard those words when he was just 14 years old after, that, after he had been turned away by his dream high school. But it wouldn't be his last. Throughout his entire football career, from Pop Warner to the NFL, the New England Patriots wide receiver was constantly having to work hard, have competitive energy and mental toughness to overcome the naysayers, wrote Nicole Yang in an article about Edelman's new memoir called Relentless. And of course, during the Super Bowl, we have commercials, right? And check out this commercial that I have for you that aired from Verizon that many people missed. Check it out. Hi, my name is Anthony Lynn. In 2005, I was in a horrible car accident. I was hit by a car going 50 miles an hour. And I promise you, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the first responders. They told me that I flew 45, 50 feet in the air. The doctor told me, he said, you're very, you're very lucky. It was a miracle. Hi, Coach. My name is Jim Riddle. This is my partner, Craig Kelly. We are the first two first responders on scene. Coach, my name is Skyla Bosco. I was the paramedic on Medic Engine 1 that evening. I've often thought about, you know, who showed up that night. I never thought I'd see you. I mean, it's unbelievable. They said I had to have some angels with me that night to survive. I believe you guys are angels. Thank you, guys. Thank you. The team that wouldn't be here. That's a 12-part documentary series by Peter Berg that pays tribute to the first responders who rescued NFL players, as well as Los Angeles Chargers head football coach Anthony Lynn, which we just saw. Now, in a way, those first responders, what are they? They're a team, a team of people that are making a difference in the lives of others with different skill sets and roles throughout the process of an emergency. Now, many of you are saying, well, Chris, what does all this have to do with running into giants and specifically Noah, which we are discussing today? Well, in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, we read this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Friends, this is a unique thought. This verse says that we are in a race or a game called life. And every day that we are living, we are in this game. And the Bible also clearly says that there's literally people in heaven cheering us on, supporting us. And let's be honest, this game of life it's difficult. It's challenging. And there's an enemy that wants to hold people back, to keep people from running in this game. The Bible says that there's heroes cheering us on, supporting us. However, just like in the Super Bowl, when fans are cheering from their seats, the players that are on the field, they don't hear them. And there are quite often times within our lives that we don't hear we don't hear those heroes cheering us on. That, that we don't hear the voice of God supporting us because of these difficulties in our lives. It all just kind of sounds like noise. It all just kind of sounds like we're going underwater. And it's at that point that we need to slow down. We need to gather together. We need to hit the pause button. For some of us, we need to even stop and just look at these people's lives, these heroes of the faith that are described in Hebrews chapter 11. And this morning, that is my goal. It is my goal to, to give you a picture, a snapshot of Noah's life that will impact us and change us and, and get us back in the game, moving forward, running down the field. Now, when we first read about Noah, we, we learn that civilization was living in a condition of wickedness. 
In Genesis 6, chapter 5, it says this. God saw that human evil was out of control. People thought evil, imagined evil, evil from morning to night. In other words, sin was destroying the world. And that brings us to our first thought that we learned about Noah this morning. One person, one person can make a difference. This morning, this talk is for anyone who has ever said, my life doesn't count. Who has ever said, I'm not good enough. I'm not talented enough. I missed my opportunity. Friends, let's be honest. This talk is for all of us. Because there's times in in this game, in this race that we're in called life, that we feel defeated, useless, not important. And this is what we read in Genesis 6, 5 through 8. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing. All the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, even the birds of the sky, I am sorry I ever made them. And then look, but, but Noah found favor with the Lord. Noah found favor with the Lord. And see, Jesus actually references Noah in his teachings when he said, as it was in the days of Noah. And Jesus was highlighting the simple truth that, friends, we're currently living in times that are evil and ungodly. And see, for many of us, as we work and go through life and and live our schedules, we, we don't often see it. We don't often reflect on these evil times, if you will. And you say, Chris, is it really that bad? Well, just think about some of these statistics. There are currently 40.3 million victims of human trafficking around the world. 81% of them are trapped in forced labor. 25% of them are children. 75% of them are women and girls. There's currently a political battle in our country over third trimester abortion and the murdering of children. There's racism, wars, lying, destruction. Right? Jesus challenges the people and his teaching, there's evil, just like in the days of Noah. And throughout the New Testament, we read and hear about a day of judgment that all people in the world will face. But there is hope. We read this again about Noah. But Noah was different. God liked what he saw in Noah. And think about this. God was ready to give up on everyone. Wipe the earth clean, but he found Noah. And today, God is still looking for people to make a difference. God is looking for one person to stand up, to be a difference maker, to be a light to the world. And friends, we have to guard against the temptation to view life as all about you and me. You know, our society, our culture constantly communicates to us in commercials and social media. Just take it easy. Focus on yourself. Worry about your retirement. Don't don't change. Don't worry about other people. It's all about you. This simply is not God's best. God is looking for someone that is different. Someone that is willing to make a difference in the lives of others. And friends, will you answer that call this morning, which brings us to our next thought. Jesus followers impact their families. Jesus followers impact their families. Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. When everything was ready, the Lord said to Noah, Go into the boat with all your family. For among all the people of the earth, I can see that you alone are righteous. See, God didn't find favor with Noah's family. He found favor with Noah. And when you make a difference, you impact people around you. I mean, let's be honest. Every single one of us are impacting people around us each and every day. But the problem is this. Do you impact them for good or bad? Because see, every one of us impact people positively or negatively. And it's my responsibility to come here, to gather together, and to challenge you to focus on the good, to allow God to use you to be better, to be a difference maker, 
This is what we read in the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 30 to 31. He led them out of the jail and asked, Sirs, what do I have to do to be saved, to really live? They said, put your entire trust in Jesus. Then you will live as you were meant to live, and everyone in your household included. Listen to that promise. Now, that's not a promise that says you go ahead and, and begin your relationship with Jesus and, and your whole family is going to be saved as well. That's not the promise. See, in the Greek, the word that's used for everyone in your house is the word oikos, O-I-K-O-S. And oikos literally means you will impact your sphere of influence. See, friends, when we begin a relationship with Jesus, it's not about us anymore. It's about others. Jesus says, let your light shine before others. And all it simply means is, live your life in such a way that you impact others. What is your sphere of influence? Well, sociologists say that our sphere of influence is about 12 people. This number is determined by adding up the number of people that you spend an hour or more a day with. See, that's your sphere of influence. Normally, it's around 12 people, and it can be no more than 17. Now, when you hear those numbers, think about this statistic from the United States. The average dad in the U.S. spends seven minutes a day with their children. For most dads, their kids are not in their sphere of influence. Friends, if you're in a relationship with Jesus this morning, this needs to wake you up. This needs to make you realize the importance of speaking into people's lives. How do we impact others with our faith? How do we do it? You know, 12 years ago, my wife and I, Jessica, my wife is here this morning. If you get an opportunity to high-five her, please do. We planted a church in Hagerstown, Maryland, Hub City Vineyard. And when we planted this church, we were excited about all that was, God was going to do. But, but, but it's funny, when you plant a church, you know, my, my family, my immediate family, my mom and dad and my brother, they're, they're not followers of Jesus when we planted the church. And when you go back home, quite often it's a challenge to go back home because there's a lot of questions about why you're doing it and the point of it. And when we planted this church, it, within our mind, we always thought if there was one person that would never come and be a part of my church, it was my brother. See, my brother and I are 10 years apart. I was one of those children that was like, whoa, where'd that come from, right? <laughs> and one of those mistakes, if you will. And uh, he struggled growing up in his teen years. He spent a lot of time in prison. We had no relationship with one another. He wasn't a brother to me. I didn't even really know him, to be honest with you. And, it's, and it was hard. And moving back, you know, not having this relationship, not knowing him that much, we would, we would see each other at Christmas and on Thanksgiving. But other than that, we had no relationship. Well, it was about four years ago. I wasn't even speaking on a Sunday morning. My brother and his wife showed up at our community of faith, at our church. Mike Turgiano shared and challenged people about their relationship with Jesus. I still remember the day he and his wife rose their hands and accepted Jesus into their heart that morning. And for the last four years, he's been part of our church. And that's a family member that my wife and I said, he'll never come to our church, right? Now hear me out. I didn't even invite him. I didn't. I had no relationship with him. Now I have a relationship with him now. I didn't even invite him. It wasn't my words, but you know what it was? It was the actions of our community of faith. See, him and his wife were struggling in their marriage, and they knew about people that had their marriages restored in our church, and they wanted a change, and they wanted hope, and they showed up on a Sunday morning, and is their marriage restored? Yes. Are they in a relationship with Jesus? Yes. Is, has my father now given his life to Jesus? Yes. Right? And, and you see how it is. It's just about living your life, being a light. You know, I got a phone uh, message on my phone a week ago. Uh, I, don't, I don't answer numbers that I don't know. But, but anyway, this woman left this long vo voicemail on my cell phone, and, and I could hear it in her heart. She had this cry out in her heart. Chris, uh, you don't know me, but, but I know you, and this is how I know you. My son is in Teen Challenge. He's struggling with a heroin addiction. We have an incredible heroin ec epidemic in Maryland. And, he goes, and, and she said on the voice, and she goes, but I heard about your church. I heard that there's people there that have come out of recovery, that have experienced healing, that aren't walking in addiction anymore. Will you please meet with my son? Again, I don't even know these people, 
but what is the what is the sphere of influence? How am I impacting them? By an example, right? And friends, you can do the same. Followers of Jesus impact their families. And what is their families? It's their sphere of influence, which brings us to our next thought. Jesus' followers impact a generation. Genesis 7, 1, next God said to Noah, now board the ship, you and all your family, out of everyone in this generation, you're the righteous one. See, we have a responsibility to our generation to be an example of God to them. Noah was the only one left in his entire generation. And God wants to use us to bring life to our generation, to bring hope, to bring meaning. So if you're here this morning, it doesn't matter your age, what you do in life, what school you go to. If you're in a relationship with Jesus, right, you got to realize that you're called to make a difference in your generation. And see, what happens so often in churches is we have to guard against church consumerism. And what is church consumerism? It simply means that that people have this view, right, that the church is for them, right? That, that, That the church is there to serve them, to make them better, right? When it's the exact opposite. We're all the church. You know, and as a pastor, I constantly hear from people, you know, Chris, Chris, take us deep. Give me some deep theological teaching. Rack my my brain on some new doctrine that that I didn't understand about God. You know? And and people challenge me. Are you going to take us deep in these series? And I look back at them. I said, you want to go deep? Who's the last person you led to Jesus? Right? You want to go deep? Go ahead and lead someone to Jesus because that's what it's all about. Right? It's a challenge to move forward. Right? It's a challenge that we want to reach out to people and be difference makers in this generation. And when people say that to me, I say, you might want to find a new church. Because guess what? I'll have deep teaching, but you're going to constantly be challenged to be out in that community serving people and seeing lives change. Because that's what God wants for us. These weekend gatherings that we're a part of, you know what I view them as? I view them as a halftime Super Bowl talk, a halftime pep talk. It says, hey, friends, let's make adjustments. Let's look at our hearts. Let's look at our mistakes. Let's look at our struggles. Let's make these adjustments. Let's change because God wants us to win the game. Because in the end, guess what? He wins. And he wants many, many people to be a part of this team, right? To, to be serving, to be loving, And we have to guard against being nearsighted. Now, many of you don't know this, but I'm nearsighted. So what nearsighted simply means is this. All of you sitting in these chairs this morning, you're a blur to me. (laughs) Right? I I can't see your faces. I just see a blur of colors. And and I know you're there. Like, I can make the outline of your your figures, but I can't see your face. Now, my wife is constantly on me. Chris, you got to wear your glasses. I haven't come to a place of wearing them yet because it makes me feel old. Okay, and, and I just don't want to be old yet, right? So, so that's my problem. But often in the church, we become nearsighted. And what that simply means is we focus inward on ourselves. And, and, and God wants us to be farsighted. He wants us to see outward. He wants us to see the crowds. He wants us to see our coworkers, our classmates. He wants us to see our, our family members and our neighbors. And he wants us to zero in on them and their struggles so that we can what? make a difference in the lives of others so that we can be focused on them and allowing ourselves to serve them in such a way that Virginia Beach is turned upside down. We read this in Acts chapter 13. It says, this is not a reference to David for after David had done the will of God in his own generation, he died and was buried with his ancestors. You see that? It's, it's a referencing us that we make a difference in our generation, David did, and we can do the same. We can do this with God's help. Listen to what Mary sung when she was celebrating that God used her. In Luke 1, 50, it says, He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. And what that means is we receive this mercy when we're in this relationship with God, which moves us to our next thought. Jesus followers make a difference for God. It's not about us. It's all about God. God is looking for someone to make a difference. And friends, just imagine the impact locally that we would have if all of us gathered last night, here this morning during this first gathering, would high-five each other and say, yes, put me in, coach. 
I want to play. I want to be on the playing field, making a difference in the lives of others. Look at what God says. God says in Isaiah 6, he says, I'm looking for someone to receive my power. I'm looking for someone to receive my love and my grace and then give it away. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed. Your sins are forgiven. See, that's the grace and the mercy and the power. Then I heard the Lord asking, whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? Notice the response. After he received the grace, after he'd been touched by God, he said, here I am, send me. And God said, yes, go. God is saying that to you this morning. Friends, he's saying, yes, go. I'm sending you. I'm looking for one person to make a difference. Jesus said this in Matthew 28. Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life. We are called to impact our sphere of influence. Right now, now don't allow that to overwhelm you. When I say go and make a difference, it, it doesn't mean you have to save the whole world. He wants you to focus on how many people? 12 people. Your sphere of influence. He wants you to focus on those 12 people with these three simple daily steps. If you live these three simple daily steps, right, day after day after day, you will make a difference for Jesus. And the first is this. Don't be afraid to stand out in the crowd. Don't be afraid to stand out in the crowd because, you see, God is going to ask you to do something foolish. He's going to ask you to do something crazy that goes against the crowd, that goes against the society. But yet, hear me out. So many of us don't make a difference because we aren't different. I'm going to say that again. So many of us don't make a difference because we aren't different. P.T. Barnum said this. No one ever made a difference by being like everyone else. No one ever made a difference by being like everyone else. And I have that same story. I'll be honest with you. When I planted uh, our church, when I planted the Hub City Vineyard, for the first four years, we did okay, right? We were reaching people. We were seeing lives change. We were serving people. But guess what? I had this issue in my heart that I was fearful of man. I, I wouldn't tackle some hard subjects. I wasn't being as outward as God was wanting me to. I wasn't, I wasn't inviting and including. I wasn't being radical. I wasn't being no fool for Christ. I'll be honest with you. But one faithful January 1st, we have, this, we have this event on January 1st in our town called the Polar Bear Plunge, right? And, and for the first four years of our church, we would serve at the Polar Bear Plunge. We would give away hot chocolate and hot coffee to people that were hungover from New Year's Eve. And I'd think, look at these idiots jumping in the frozen cold river. What, you know, that's great that they're doing this. They're going to be woken up from their, you know, from being hungover. Well, one, hear me out. One sun, it was a Sunday, actually, that we were there. It was about eight years ago. God said, I want you to get in that water. I was like, what? God said, I want you to get in that water. He said, you want to be a fool for me? You get in that water. You got to get over yourself. I had to put on a Batman, Batman costume because I wouldn't get in that water, people knowing me. I got full decked out in a Batman costume that we had from, from our harvest party, and I jumped in that river, man. And you say, well, Chris, that's just stupid. What's that have anything to do with Jesus? Remember, God told me to do it. And, and since that day, Whatever God tells me to do, guess what? Chris does it. It made me get over myself so that I would actually be a fool. And you say, well, what's that translate into, into your relationship with Jesus? How's that translate into your church? Friends, ever since I did that, our church has multiplied and multiplied and multiplied years after years after year. Right? So now that the point we, we just bought a new location, a new building, we're expanding. You know, uh, three years ago, we had 226 people baptized in one year. Hallelujah. Right? And you say, well, what's that, what's that have to do with being a fool? When I got out of the way, when I got over myself and my insecurities and my doubts and was saying, hey, hey, God, I'll be a fool for you, he responds. And he'll do the same for you too, but it's about being obedient. And you say, well, Chris, what's this have to do about Noah? Well, think about Noah, right? God told Noah to build a boat when it wasn't even raining, like there was no rain. There was no need for a boat. And the whole time that Noah was building this boat, what happened? All the people were ridiculing him, making fun of him, putting him down. 
And, 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 don't, and don't get me wrong, for the first two or three years after, after Noah heard from God, it would have been easy to build the boat, right? He heard God's voice. But, it, but scholars tell us that it took anywhere from 75 to 80 years to build that boat. Could you imagine what it must have been like in year 67? Like people still hounding him. You're a fool. You're a joke. What are you doing? Here's Noah still building the boat, right? The point is this. For many of us, for many Americans, you know what February means? It means that all those New Year's resolution and changes just ended and you just gave up on them in a month. Here we got Noah being faithful for how long? 80 years. God is challenging us today. Be a fool for me. Right? Don't, don't, be a, don't be afraid to stand out to be a difference maker. Proverbs 29, fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. Romans 12, 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of the world. Let God transform you in a new person by changing the way you think. That means you got to get over your attitudes and your judgments. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Don't be afraid to stand out. Young people. You're at a party and you know what happened in there is wrong. Don't be afraid to say this is wrong. I'm out. I'm leaving. Young people, don't be afraid to stand up to those that are bullying others. To stand in the gap. To smile and say, no, he's my friend. She's my friend. Right? Hey, you adults, when the gossip starts to happen, shut it down and let truth come in. Because gossip destroys churches. Destroys relationships. Be an example in your workplace. When you show up to work, work. Put your phone away. Don't worry about social media. Show up early. Work hard. Work late. Speak truth when given the opportunity. That's what you do when you stand out. It's hard to live for God in a selfish culture. But we read this in 1 Peter 2.9. You are not like that. You're a chosen people. You're a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. If we don't do it, no one else will. Will you, will you go against the grain? Will you stand up and be a difference maker? Next step is this. Don't be afraid to do something for the first time. Chances are not only is God going to ask you to be a fool, right? But he's going to ask you to do something different. He's going to ask you to do something new. And to be a difference maker, you have to obey God and not worry about looking foolish. Right? For me, I planted a church. Right? And, and hear me out. Most church planting statistics, 90% of all churches, church plants fail. So I had a 10% success rate in front of me when God calls me to plant this church. Right? Most people look at me and think, what are you thinking? And not only that, not only does God call you to play in a church, but, but my wife and I, we bought a house up in Syracuse, fire-damaged house. We restored it. When we sold it, we made about 45000 something like that. A lot of profit, right? You know what God said? Put that in my church, right? Not only does he say, leave everything. Leave your job, right? Leave your, leave your salary. Leave your insurance. You know, have nothing when you relocate, but, but invest everything that you own and everything that you are into that church. Right? It's foolish. For the first three or four years, remember my family? In planning that church, my parents would constantly say, when are you going to get a real job? I'm not making that up. It was hard, man. Right? But God calls us to do things for the first time. Hebrews 11:7. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. And by his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world. He received the righteousness that comes from faith. See, friends, faith is a leap, right? You have to take a step to be a difference maker, to experience a miracle, if you will. Think about Peter. What did Peter have to do to walk on water? He had to get out of the boat. Right? He had to get out of the boat. He had to step out of the boat onto the water. And that's what God is calling us to this morning. You know, some of you walked in these doors and you didn't know what God had for you, but God wants to speak something to you directly today. There's words that God wants to whisper in your ear this morning. And for some of you, he's saying, ask forgiveness. For some of you, he's saying, slow down. For some of you, he's saying, hey, call them. To someone, he's saying, start today. To another person, he's saying, get help. Be honest. Say you're sorry. Fix your marriage. Receive healing. Change. 
be a difference maker. God is whispering to us here this morning. And he's saying, get in the game, friends. This world needs my love, my hope, my grace. James 5. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Friends, just go and serve. Just go love people. Allow your actions to scream at them, which brings us to our final step. Don't be afraid to share the good news. It's the greatest thing we could ever give anyone. Listen to this challenge that Jesus left for us. Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out. Train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life, make, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I've commanded you. I'll be with you to the, to the day after day after day, right up to the end of the age. And he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news. Now, hear me out. So many of us say, I don't, Chris, I can't preach the good news. Okay, fine. Don't worry about it. God's with you. He'll give you the words. Right? And remember, Jesus referenced Noah. This is the end times. These times are evil. Right? Well, well Peter did the same thing. 2 Peter 3.9 says this. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promises. Some people think, no, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. So God wants everyone to experience his grace and his forgiveness. And he's waiting for one person to say, yes, I'll be a difference maker. Can we stand together? Let's stand together this morning. Holy Spirit, I just ask you to come into this place. God, I thank you for moving in this place and working in here today. God, I thank you for your voice whispering to us and speaking to us, sharing with us, God. I thank you for new life and the promise that you gave us. And this morning, you know, God put on my heart, I need to pray for anyone that heard those whispers. There's some of you here this morning as I was sharing that get help, change, uh, uh, ask forgiveness, call someone. That, that just spoke to your heart, that God really just, just resonated in your mind, in your heart and said, yeah, that's me. I need that forgiveness, that grace. I need that healing. If that's you this morning, will you slip your hand up and say, yes, Chris, I need that prayer. Put them up high for me. Put them up high. Put them up high. Now, this is what we're going to do. Keep your hands up. Don't let them down. Keep your hands up. This is how we do it up in Maryland. We're going to do it a little different here this morning. Keep your hand up. Men with men, women with women. Look around, friends. If there's a hand up around you and you're a woman, go and, go and put your hand on that shoulder. And everybody keep your hand up until someone comes to you and prays with you. Keep your hands up. Keep them up. Men with men, women with women. Get to them. We're going to pray for these people right now. There's two hands over here that need some prayer. Come on, friends. Let's go. You got Jesus in you. Don't worry. He's going to give you the words to pray into their lives. Come on. Come, Holy Spirit. Now just pray into their heart, God, whatever it is. We pray grace. We pray mercy. We pray forgiveness, God. We pray encouragement. Holy Spirit, move in these lives, God. Thank you for this honesty. Thank you for this life change that's happening right now. We just pray for a newness and a freshness, God. We just pray that God, as they rose their hands and said, yes, I need to change, I need grace, I need forgiveness, whatever's happening in their heart, may that hand raised be a hand of saying, I will be a difference maker. I will make a difference, God. Move in this place, God. We pray for healing, God. I pray for healing over here. Someone, someone needs healing over here in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Now, with eyes closed, no one looking around, no one looking around. When you have a talk like this, it would, be, it would be just a failure on my part not to share this. No one looking around. This is a private thing. If there's anyone here this morning that hasn't started that relationship with Jesus, has been thinking about God, thinking about Jesus, but it's riding the fence, you're not sure you're in a relationship with God, I want to pray with you right now. I'm not going to ask you to come up here. I'm not going to point you out. But I do need you to put your hand up and say, yes, I need Jesus this morning. Is there anybody like that? Put them up high. Yeah, I got one over here. I got another over there. So we're all going to pray together. Everyone pray these words. Because we're all doing it together. 
Jesus, I'm a broken person. I'm full of sin. Forgive me. I believe you are the Savior of the world. Change me. Make me new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Allow me to be a difference maker. In Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Now celebrate. Two people gave their life to Jesus this morning. That's right. Get loud. It's okay. We like to party when that happens because the angels are partying as well. God bless you guys. Let's worship and let's get loud for Jesus. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.